Hello everyone and welcome to today's webinar. We are EBS, your experienced technology partner. We specialize in the deployment of Sage Business Management and Microsoft Solutions, managed services and secure on-premises and cloud-based infrastructure. We are now in our 44th year of business, of being in business. My name is Darren Tolley and I'm one of the account managers here at EBS. Today, we are joined by our partner, Sensornet, a leader in combating cyber threats. I'd like to extend a warm welcome to Gareth Lockwood, who will take us through what sets Sensornet apart in the cyber security landscape. We are recording today's presentation and we'll make this available to you in the next few days. There are lots of recordings on our YouTube channel. Remember to hit subscribe to receive notifications when we load new videos. If you have any questions, please put them in the chat or there will be an opportunity at the end of the presentation in the Q&A session. So without further ado, let's get this show on the road. Uh, over to you, Gareth. Right, let's get going. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Um, so this is uh, an introductory webinar to Sensonet. Um, it, it's you know good to see We've got a few names and organizations here wanting to learn a bit more. Uh, it, it will be recorded, so um, obviously you can share it as well after which would be uh, much appreciated. Um, and hopefully, obviously, over the next kind of hour or so, you'll get some useful insights, um, see the platform if we if we get time, but I also want to make sure we give you the context and a little bit of detail into uh, you know what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, so I guess by way of introduction, uh, for those that don't know me, uh, Gareth Lockwood, um, I've been in uh, kind of high tech and cybersecurity industries for 22 or so years now, um, support, consulting, product management, marketing, you know, kind of seen and done it all really. Um, at Sensonet, I look after our go to market strategy and our product strategy, um, you know, what enticed me minutes and then we'll get going. So uh, make yourselves comfortable. And then we'll get going. So uh, welcome everyone. Hey everyone, um, we're just, uh, just coming to five. Uh, five past the uh, start time, so we'll just give it 30 seconds and we'll get going. So uh, welcome everyone, and uh, we'll start in a couple of seconds. Right, let's get going. Um, hello, welcome everyone. Um, so this is uh, an introductory webinar to Sensonet. Um, it, it's you know good to see we've got a few names and organizations here wanting to learn a bit more. Uh, it, it will be recorded, so um, obviously you can share it as well after which would be uh, much appreciated. Um, and hopefully, obviously, over the next kind of hour or so, you'll get some useful insights um, see the platform if we if we get time, but I also want to make sure we give you the context and a little bit of detail into uh, you know what we do, why we do it, and how we do it. Um, so I guess by way of introduction, uh, for those that don't know me, uh, Gareth Lockwood, um, I've been in uh, kind of high tech and cybersecurity industries for 22 or so years now. Um, support, consulting, product management, marketing, you know, kind of seen and done it all really. Um, at Sensonet, I look after our go-to-market strategy and our product strategy. Um, you know, what enticed me, uh, I guess, to, to move to Sensonet was a lot around our ethos and the focus not only on innovation, but also kind of making sure that the technology that we're developing is presented in such a way that it goes to reduce the complexity um, especially for those people who have to use it day in and, and day out at, at the coalface, so to speak. Um, so Sensinet has a focus or, or a sweet spot, I suppose you'd call it, for an average uh, small to mid-sized enterprise. So, so that kind of mid-market customer profile. So that's anywhere from 
you know, a, a few tens or hundreds or so of employees right up to the tens of thousands. And, and that obviously encompasses a wide range of demands um, and, and business resources. So, you know, some have really sophisticated op centers, you know, larger cybersecurity teams. Others have got, you know, pretty modest sized teams, uh, meager budgets, you know, they've got to do a lot with a little. So our goal really is to, I guess, cater um, to the audience. So, um, you know, we, we tend to select complementary features and technologies whilst at the same time kind of avoiding some of the buzzwords that uh, you'll you'll hear and, and see a lot in, in the industry. So, you know, when you hear things about SSE and SASE and, and ZTNA and all those kind of buzzwords that are thrown around by analysts, you can sink a lot of time into just understanding them and even longer trying to deploy them where actually there may be a more effective, more efficient and more suitable ways to do that. Um, we have two and a half thousand or so clients. Uh, that's over a million users in total across predominantly UK, but, but also in 45 or so other countries. Um, the majority of our clients are in that kind of 500 to 5,000 uh, user range, but we're constantly growing that um, year on year because of that, that focus that I touched on earlier to deliver that, uh, that, that very targeted set of features with that you know, white glove kind of world-class client support service that you can give when, when you choose to focus. So, you know, we've been recognized, we've been awarded, you know, over the last kind of two years, but really, really this year, uh, you know, there's been a lot of recognition around that, that focus and, you know, being uh, a UK-based vendor in a sea full of US multinationals really, really just help us stand out. So, Brief agenda for today. Um, I'll, I'll kind of go over some background context. You know, we'll, we'll, as any other cyber presentation that we do, you know, give a little bit of the current threat landscape. That'll just set some of the rationale uh, for some of our product decisions and, and our roadmap. And then we'll go into some specifics around, I guess, what makes us unique. Um, you know, what we do differently to the other guys out there, uh, where you will get that value from, and then. Time permitting, we'll, we'll have a quick uh, kind of whistle stop tour of the dashboard live. Um, if not, we've got some screenshots um, just to kind of show you how easy it is to, to kind of deploy and administer. So with that in mind, uh, let's dive in a little bit. Um, I think, you know, being that cybersecurity is still a constant cat and mouse game, you know, the landscape does pretty much change on a, on a daily basis. Um, there are still some common threads within that that really haven't changed much over, over the past decade. You know, the, the attack types themselves, um, still email, still phishing, still spam campaigns, although the trend is, is to continue, they're actually becoming more and more sophisticated. So if we take a look at maybe some of the recent developments uh, that have happened, you know, what to watch out for, factors that contribute to the problem, and then you know where our solution might fit in. So I think it's pretty much safe to say that, you know, for those of us that regularly read the, the tech press and, and the IT specific press, there's pretty much never a day goes by without some sort of data breach um, or some newsworthy hack or, you know, someone's made a mistake or, or lost something. And that impacts companies big and small, right? Um, since the pandemic, this trend of malware, ransomware, phishing attacks, that's continuing to rise, unfortunately, upwards and to the right. Um, and actually, if you if you do check uh, people like NCSC, um, for, for those of you that are UK-based, they publish an annual report. Their 2023 review came out, uh, I think it was a few weeks or maybe a month ago. And really, their goal is to raise an awareness within the small business and, and mid-market to effectively what is an increasingly unpredictable landscape. Um, the, the, the rise of AI has got a lot, uh, a lot of uh, contributions to that. Uh, the effect on businesses due to the, the, the geopolitical situation and the crises that are going on around the world. And then obviously this increase that we're seeing in state-sponsored attacks, unfortunately means this is a trend that's going to continue to to rise, and you know it, it's it's not going away. And obviously on screen here, there are really just a few examples of and I think some go back to you know the start of the year, but I've tried to pull as many stats from the last kind of six months or so that impact predominantly the UK, as I said, both big and small. And unfortunately, the bad guys have got absolutely no moral compass when it comes to who they pick on their, their targets and their victims. 
they've picked up um, a number of charities uh, and, and non-profits, uh, the public sector, so uh, healthcare, education, um, you know, public organisations that, that support us uh, socially have all been hit. Um, and also, we've seen rather worryingly over the last kind of few months, you know, data breaches that have led to that link between the digital world and the physical world. So when we look at um, Met Police, uh, PSNI, Northern Ireland, the police service there, you know, public services when it comes to things like the Electoral Commission, you can quite see how what was a purely digital interaction um, has now become has become physical and the threats become that much more concerning. Um, you know, there are a couple of examples on here um, on either side. You know, LastPass, who we've probably all seen in the press, um, it, it's estimated that as of as of this month, about $35 million in total has been stolen because of um, the, the, the way LastPass was breached. Um, it was actually um, a human error and an engineer left something um, open to, to the public. Um, and it's, you know, millions and millions of pounds per day that gets lost. LastPass, for those who don't know, is a you know, password manager and a, and a data vault that, you know, once the, the master password gets lost to that, obviously you have accounts tied to it. They could be crypto accounts, they could be banking, you know, the, the, the list goes on. So that's why, you know, it's in the tens of millions of dollars from a breach that happened, you know, only in 2022. So, so that's that's one side of it. Um, the UK's biggest breach by far, I, I think, is there. That's the UK Electoral Commission. It's about 40 million voters who have had their details exposed on the dark web. Um, and you can imagine these raised from, um, you know, uh, personally identifiable information, voting records, so on and so forth. So as you see this rise and rise, you can quite quickly see how this becomes a much bigger problem as it snowballs. And it's getting to the point today, I think, where many of the big insurers who have, you know, started maybe almost a decade ago now, but, but in the last kind of three to five years, creating policies specifically for cyber risk, um, they're actually becoming to the point now where that is uninsurable. You know, the the, the underwriting, as you can see by the, the comment from Zurich there, is becoming to the point where the, the, the premiums would be just unachievable day to day. And if you pair that with the fact that with the modern workforce, or what we, we class as hybrid or, or remote workforce, the traditional network perimeter that was our kind of primary line of defense is gone. It's, it's, it's dead completely. So with data everywhere, um, you know, on-prem, on-device, in the cloud, um, it, it is to the point now where you know, we have to rely on not only our defences, but that of shared services as well. And if you think about the average mid-size enterprise today, we use in excess of 300 SaaS applications. So you may have a portfolio that you think is, you know, maybe 100 or so, but if you look at, you know, the, this kind of notion of shadow IT, so the applications that our users access maybe unknowingly or we don't scan, it is it is a big problem. And over the last 12 months, the, the attacks on SaaS infrastructure has risen 300%. So it is getting to the point now where as an IT organization, you've got to have eyes everywhere, not just on your emails, but also on the apps that your uh, users are you know, using to, to collaborate and communicate and share data. Um, and it is becoming you know, more and more of a handful to, to really try and manage that in a secure but also efficient way. Now, if we look at the growth in, I mean, AI is a kind of umbrella term, but, you know, hacking today is becoming less and less about talent and craft, right? You know, back back when I started, there were some pretty well-known, um, you know, th there were reputations of, of some guys that, that they, they did it purely for that almost um, celebrity um, kind of exposure, but now it's 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 purely where the money is. It, it's so there is no skill. So you can kind of see the left hand side of this slide here. I've taken just a handful of screenshots over the last month or so from various dark web marketplaces, and you can buy, you know, really really sophisticated malware payloads, ransomware, uh, phishing campaigns with, you know, the delivery mechanism that goes with it, um, the the back end infrastructure. For a you know a meal out, price of a round of drinks, few coffees, it, it's really really achievable to to anyone. You know the, these marketplaces that you can kind of see, um, they're becoming more mainstream. Um, 
or if, you know, mainstream in the way they work. So you can leave a review for something you bought. You can pay through uh, escrow services, through crypto. You can, you know, um, have loyalty discounts for the more you purchase. It, it's becoming like the Ebay's and the Amazons and the AliExpresses of this world. Um, it, obviously, the uh, Interpol and, and the, the various different cybersecurity um, organizations within government are trying to crack down on these. So there were some really popular ones. Uh, you may have heard of things like Silk Road in the past or Hydra. They've they've been taken down, but as soon as one gets taken down, another one pops up in its place. Um, so that again, something that's not going to go away. But I think what's more concerning here is the growth in these um, large language models, AI platforms. You, you can actually see here on the left hand side, we've got this kind of bluey gray um, screenshot in the middle. Um, uh, that's something called Hack GPT. Um, so we're probably all familiar with ChatGPT. Um, th this is an automated uh, tool that, in effect, you can create a piece of malware, very sophisticated, targeting the people you want, looks legitimate, um, you know, potentially in a language you don't speak, on, on brand. It doesn't have the grammar, the spelling errors that are so prevalent that we're trained to look out for in, in phishing emails. And all you have to do is write a prompt and tell it to create something um, you want and that could be an email but that's just the tip of the iceberg really you know it, we've seen spoofed photographs um audio notes and voicemails there are some really compelling deep fake videos out there at the moment that is effectively really accessible um in fact there's there a really really interesting piece of research that came out um a couple of months ago be actually before this um hack gpt was released but they used chat gpt to hypothetically write a piece of malware that went into an organization through a phishing attack, exfiltrated um, some, some data through a piece of, of malware, encrypted all the data, and then held it to ransom. And that was created in literally an hour in what three or four years ago would have probably taken half a dozen malware developers probably a couple of weeks to create. So that level of accessibility is just compounding the, 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 the kind of growth trajectory and all the, uh, the attacks that are out there at the moment. And really, this is where we see we, we effectively start to see that impact. So we've got this perfect storm for anyone who's in IT that they, they have to deal with. We've got this increasing attacks. We've got this increase in friction, I guess is probably the best way to describe it, between the security parts of the, the organization and the, the revenue generating or the kind of business as usual, guys. You know, a lot of anecdotal evidence that we're hearing, plus the, the kind of quantitative data we're, we're seeing from the analysts is saying that a lot of employees are feeling uh, a, a friction or the fact that security organizations are trying to put too many controls in place. That means that security is, is overtaking profitability and you know efficiency and, and, and operations. Um, so we're seeing that it, it's often at odds with with the other parts of the business you know we were seeing that when the objectives of let's say someone in sales or um or supply chain um is at odds with security those people take more risks they even actively look to circumvent some of the guardrails or find find ways around actually uh, in the stats this year gartner have said over 90 percent of the people they they surveyed said if it helped me do my job quicker, better, I would actively look for a way around. And the problem with that is the perceived reward and the perceived risk are at either ends of the scale. So, so they, they don't necessarily have that accountability as an end user that, that we in IT, IT kind of do. And I guess the, the third leg in this stool is that, you know, although we're seeing these improvements year on year, there are still massive gaps between the knowledge of the end users and the experience, I guess, of the, the, the security practitioners in the UK when it comes to cybersecurity. So whilst things like security awareness training are, are increasing, which is great, you know, we still need the tools, we still need the talent, um, and, and unfortunately the pressure is mounting on the CISOs and the IT directors and, and, and the leaders. And not only are the users being targeted with this I guess increasing volume and, and sophistication of attack. You know, we we hear things like BEC business email compromise, spear phishing, CEO fraud, account account takeover. They're they're pretty much standard grammar terms now in in the industry. Yet, 
the teams that are there to to monitor and and protect the the users are under more stress more pressure and we're seeing that impact on on turnover and the uk is kind of at the forefront of that unfortunately and whilst we've seen the trend going in the right direction we're still only filling about 40 percent of open job roles in cybersecurity. so what we're seeing is organizations having to look at either the lower end of the scale when it comes to experience you know that that kind of tenure curve when it comes to hiring is we're taking a lot more recent grads um, apprenticeships who take that time to ramp up and build that experience and the upshot of this unfortunately is that there is going to be a tangible impact on our resilience um, as, a, as a nation and and you know as the the, the, the lifeblood that keeps the economy running in, in you know, small and medium enterprises. So now it's not really the case, and we've heard the term before, right? It's not if you'll get successfully attacked, it's now a matter of when and what do I do to mitigate that risk? And you know, when you look at the cost of those data breaches, for example, you can kind of see in that bar chart on the right here, the top three contributing factors to any financial loss are the remote workforce, so we've seen this when it comes to um, you know, the, the, the outset of the pandemic and that kind of ramp out. People now want to work from home and the, 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 the downshot of that is you know, remote devices, home broadband, we, we have to rely on either VPN technology or we have to let them use BYO devices. Second one is the skill shortage that we've, we've just touched on. And then by far and away ahead in first place is complexity. And that's organizational complexity, product feature complexity, and, and security complexity. And, and there was, a, there was a, a phrase, I can't remember who coined it now, but complexity is the enemy of security when it, when it comes to, to our industry. So something that we always have to bear in mind. So when it comes to you know, the mid-market and cybersecurity, the, the, the current landscape, as we kind of touched on, is really focused on two teams. Um, it's the people in charge of protecting the organization the digital assets, the data that goes with it, and then it's the revenue-oriented function. So if we kind of start, I, I guess the left-hand chart here alludes to it, um, analysts have predicted that the challenges that you know we are going to face as CISOs or as IT staff are no longer just technology. It's no longer just you know guardrails, security controls. They're evolving now to encompass and encapsulate also the human element. So we have got to effectively redouble our efforts to focus on the, the good, the bad, but also the people and how they interact with the data. So we're, we're redoubling our efforts with no um, extra resource. It, it, it's not a pivot, it, it's incremental. So we're effectively adding to all these, in, you know, these existing problems, uh, you know, the bandwidth of, of workers, the talent experience, it's already constrained at a time where morale is taking a hit, burnout is increasing, and obviously the we don't even have to talk about the the increase in the impact on mental health. So, you know, cybersecurity leaders now more than ever are constantly on the back foot. They're constantly on the defence. The the only outcome is is really binary. You get hacked and breached, or you don't. So there is a I guess a profound psychological impact to that that then goes to impact their decision quality, their performance. Um, and, that, and that's really one side of the coin. The, the other side is that wider business ecosystem, both, both internal and external. So, as I said, it's no longer about super hackers anymore, you know, trying to breach the network with, with clever tools. It's really about employees day to day making mistakes, leaving the doors unlocked, leaving the windows open. And, and that's this, con this concept, I guess, of insider threat. You know, when we're compensated and, and incentivized to grow, you know, for a startup, it's speed to market, it's innovation. If we're incentivized to meet a delivery goal or a release cycle, if it's a product, you know, people are likely to take more risks because they get hit in the pocket if they don't. So even at board levels now, there's this growth in, in, in acceptability of, 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 of accepting um, or having an, an appetite for risk more than it was, you know, even 12 months ago. Um, when you you weigh it up against the potential financial gains. And if you think about this post-COVID, I guess, you know, we've had to digitally enhance products so we we have a better experience for remote workers or or people interacting and communicating collaboratively. You know, we have an, an increase in contingent workforce or or outsourcing consultants um, or you know short-term resources. We've got this ever-expanding digital supply chain that's always integrated. So that attack surface that was historically a 
a network perimeter no longer exists. So we have almost this notion of um, a counterfeit reality. You know, we touched on these AI tools about, uh, you know, things that you can replicate someone's brand, someone's tone of voice. Um, you can create video at scale to, uh, uh, you know, spoof a, a user or a brand. You know, it, it's not just the business you have to think about. It's your users, your partners. Uh, so that that kind of human element that the bad guys are now preying on, um, you know, is, is much more complicated. And when you bring those two cohorts together, it's it's really a recipe for something that's potentially pretty damaging. You know, the, the captain steering the ship um, is, you know, under a lot of pressure to the point where we're seeing tangible impacts on, you know, their, their mental health, their tenure, um, you know, the 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 impact as you can kind of see here on the right hand side of the screen um of of the basics right the number of it leaders not getting enough sleep or getting less sleep has has pretty much doubled in the last uh, 12 months so we're seeing a growth in anxiety reduction in work-life balance and you can kind of see there right the the seven to nine hours that the nhs would would recommend for for average sleep every night is is not even close in our industry you know, if that continues unchecked, um, you know, the impact on the wider society could could be pretty significant. So how how can we help, right? How, how can we contribute to that in a positive way that, that helps overcome some of these challenges? So obviously, there isn't a one-size-fits-all solution to this. Um, it it kind of goes without saying every vendor will tell you something different. However, what we're trying to do is understand Understand the main contributing factors where I guess a specific technology or buzzword might not be the answer. Um, you know, how can we develop a single platform and a single interface that covers as much of that attack surface as possible across email, across the web, across the users themselves, in a way that a mid-market organization can use it and, and, and deliver it that looks at minimizing the operational burden. The management fatigue that comes with it, you know, I, yeah, I've seen CISOs in the past who've been wowed by, you know, the brands, the latest and greatest best of breed point products, marketing campaigns that go with, you know, without mentioning names, we know who they are, right? But when it comes to actually deploying that and the day-to-day -day maintenance of it, it's the security practitioner that has to get used to it, the, the plethora of different interfaces and portals you might have to access overlapping policies and, and rules, you know, the false positives that will be inevitable with, with different systems, and, you know, then managing hundreds and hundreds of alerts every single day. That's something that we want to mitigate. So through a, a kind of ethos of consolidation, simplification, through a, a single, true single pane of glass, um, that's even with, you know, new technologies, new features, we have to ensure that they're integrated seamlessly and the overall operational element is is seamless and intuitive now it goes without saying i kind of want to stress here that, that that notion of simple doesn't mean less sophisticated or poorer protection it's about presenting the controls in a way that delivers a great experience such that it becomes second nature so yeah. it's about providing not only the technology, but the support through the life of that platform. So you kind of have to look to avoid a lot of the pitfalls that many of these enterprise SaaS products with all the bells and whistles would give you as a as an SME or as a mid-market. You know, you might never use half the features or get the full benefit from them. So when you compare that to this kind of whole platform approach versus a, a portfolio approach, it's not just about usability features, experience. It's about how the they communicate between each other so if you've got high you know very highly siloed products like email web security cloud app security identity and they don't know each other exists then they don't share telemetry or intelligence you're inevitably going to introduce gaps that this bad stuff could potentially creep through so there has to be a better solution for that so if i were to summarize this i guess before we get into the products from a an, an ethos or a value proposition, this would really be it in a nutshell. As I said, it's about reducing the day-to-day -day burden on both the IT practitioners at the coalface, so to speak, but also 
giving the the right level of confidence and insights to the leaders who may want to you know report up but also have that wider view of uh, of their entire environment so we do that from the minute you make your decision to deploy sensornet the entire platform can deploy in a matter of minutes and hours right you know not months and months that we've seen with you know some of the products out there so you know you can start to reap the rewards in a very very short space of time so when it comes to you know justifying capital expenditure when it comes to resource or op opex you know you can justify that with this notion of time to value and, and you know seeing the, the the roi almost immediately so with that comes you know the development and the the roadmaps and the life cycles of the product itself so not only is our developer team based here predominantly in in, in bristol but we've got a uk based tech support uh, we've got pre and post sales engineers. We've got customer success for training and things like that to make sure that you're not left with, you know, documentation and KB articles to try and get uh, get away. It really is that that white glove approach, and we can do that because we have chosen to focus on that uh, that customer profile. So we'll go into the platform in a little bit more detail. But really, as I said, it's about delivering those key insights about your your users, their risk profile, all from kind of high level, whether that be scheduled or on-demand kind of executive reports to get a good view of your, your risk posture, all the way down to kind of forensic level, incident response, you know, interactive charts, real-time data, th those kind of things that come with it. And whilst our modules do and, and obviously can communicate between themselves, there is the ability to pick and choose. Um, so you don't have to take everything, although, you know, there are bundles that, that enable you to do that. But it's also about connectivity out to other services. So some of the more sophisticated enterprises might have a, a SIEM system or, or some other kind of uh, alerting and, and, and logging system. So fine, we can you know, send that, uh, that real time data through log streaming. Um, you know, th there's a lot more to the platform when you look at it under the hood. But really, this is just kind of the, the, the tip of the iceberg, so to speak. So this is really the, I guess, the topological view, uh, I, I guess, of the modules within the platform today. Um, we've got a number of core technologies uh, um, is the best way to explain it. So you can see kind of at the, the top half of this where we have email, web security, cloud app control, or CASB as it was previously known, um, security awareness training, and then identity. Each one has its own I guess, subset of features um, that stand up. So if you were to take email and compare it side by side to an individual, independent uh, point product vendor, you could do that. Um, email, for example, we'll, we'll start on the left. It's what we would class as an integrated cloud solution. So meaning that we have a, a, a SEG or secure email gateway architecture. So we're scanning the messages in line. So effectively you divert your, your DNS MX record to our infrastructure. That enables us to do things like AV scanning, uh, sandboxing, um, you know, all, all the, the the good stuff that comes within a solution, um, encrypted messaging services that we call secure mail, um, archiving if you want a compliant email for um, things like data retention and, and audit purposes. That's one thing, but then there's also an, an, a, a, a programmatic way. So you'll see a lot of API vendors out there you know, the, the, the Tessians, the abnormals um, uh, of, the, of the world that, that look at complementing things like Microsoft 365 by talking directly to the inbox. We can do that too. So things like post delivery deletion of messages and conversations that, uh, that will go to secure um, after the fact protection. You know, you also want to be able to enable your users or empower them to manage their own quarantines or their own allow and deny list within emails. So, so that's kind of where we we complement the the uh, productivity and collaboration suites with both you know inline and an API connectivity and security. Um, email also has its own fully um, you know very advanced fully integrated mail routing engine. So this is ideal for things like multi-cloud, multi-domain orgs. Uh, you know, perhaps you've got uh, you're you know, you're doing a lot of M&A activity, and you're incorporating other businesses or other entities within your own domain. Um, you know, as your AD, perhaps you might want to migrate them now. You might want to do them in the future. That mail routing engine allows you to do that at your own pace. Um, so you can just deliver uh, or move emails by by 
you know, division, by user group, by department. It's it's you know very very um, advanced kind of out of the box. Um, if you're moving on from email, so web and CASB go hand in hand really today. You know, from from traditional um, URL classification that's going to protect you against you know malicious domains, uh, low reputation sites, you know, stop inappropriate behaviour, those kind of things, all the way up to the, the, the SaaS element of CASB. So, you know, controlling individual access to cloud application or, or even on-prem SaaS applications. Our, our CASB module or cloud app control is probably the one piece of the puzzle that people are really jumping at today. Um, I'll touch a little bit more on how we do that, um, on how it's architected, but it's about not only protecting that kind of binary approach to allow or deny access to I don't know, let's say Salesforce or, or Google Drive or something like that. It's about giving them very, very granular action level control. So we'll, we'll talk about that later, but that really goes into that, that balance of security versus user friction. Um, all those three modules, so email, web and CASB have an underlying DLP module. So you can tag this on um, or, or I said it comes within a bundle. So this is about enhancing that security even further by looking within files as they're transmitted and shared to make sure that you're not transmitting, you know, sensitive information, company secrets, customer PII, you know, that that's really about just tightening your belt um, even more, making sure that data doesn't hang on, end up in the wrong hands. And then beyond that, we have um, what we call SAT, so security awareness training, which is an end user um, module that delivers you know, really compelling bite-sized couple of minute videos that are very engaging, um, you know, very much tailored for the UK market. But then on top of that, it's gamified through, um, you know, quizzes and, and, and games and phishing simulations. Really it enables you to, to engage with your users, make sure they're educated, but it allows you to not only test your resilience, but then build your, your security and your, your kind of paper-based policies around that as well. Um, and then finally, kind of right hand side, we've got our IDAS function, so identity and access management. So this is things like taking your I I enterprise identity, maybe that's Azure um, or Azure AD, and federating that out through to other, other services. So your users would authenticate with our platform, and then we can help them through things like SSO, even zero sign on to certain services, even if those services don't support the same standards natively. So you may have, you know, SAML or, or OIDC or no support at all. We can work uh, as a broker effectively between all those systems to connect an IDP to an SP. Um, and, and it gives you that, uh, that extra security, but also a richness in the reporting. So you, you get this much more context aware approach to everything that the users are doing. And, and you know, you have this notion of identity along with um, with security. So you can do things like, you know, step up authentication or adaptive MFA based on their identity, or maybe they're logging in from a different location. You know, you, you can have very um, agile security that comes with that with this platform. Those are the core modules, and that's all underpinned by something we call ACE, which is our automated security engine or autonomous security engine. Um, again, I'll touch on this in a little more detail in a second, but think of this as the, the kind of conductor of an orchestra. So you're, you're sitting at, uh, at a higher level, you're overseeing the activity of the individual uh, little sections of the orchestra, um, so to speak, and then they can use this to share data. So if he sees something or he or she sees something in this case in one channel, let's say it's email, they can make decisions and, and then activate actions and rules to the other ones. Um, and this is really about that, so that synergy and that intercommunication between all the, the core products. So really it's about, uh, you know, there are some really innovative use cases that we can touch on with this, but you know, that's probably one for a, a future date. So I kind of said earlier, um, the ethos is to cherry pick some of those features that we feel based on, you know, our current clientele and, and you know, their, their needs and demands that are, are an ideal fit for that mid-market profile. You know, the good thing is that many of the analysts have also got their own thoughts on, on things like future trends in the next, you know, 12, 18 months, two years, three years, 10 years kind of thing. And the great thing is we're well aligned. You know, if we, we take a few examples here from Gartner on screen, you know, they're predicting 
in the short term, things like CASB, uh, web security with the SWIGs, uh, XDR, um, all potential to have really high, high positive impact on an organization. So they're saying, well, these are the things you should be integrating into your IT strategies now if, if you haven't done so already. And then if we look a little bit further out, you know, there are things like posture management. So you'll see acronyms on there for CSPM and SSPM. So that's cloud and SaaS security posture management. We, we've developed those for a, a segment of our clients who wish to manage um, or, or scan their cloud infrastructure. So maybe you have a, an AWS infrastructure or Azure or GCP. Um, well, we can monitor that for things like misconfigurations, uh, you know, potential vulnerab vulnerabilities. Again, just creating that bigger posture around all your infrastructure. Um, and then we, you, we look at terms such as automation or hyper automation as Gartner call it, or, or modular or composable security. Potentially a little bit further out, but you know, very much high impact, something that we are looking at today. Um, you know, where we just touched on ACE, for example, being able to automate and orchestrate. Um, and then modular, I think you can hopefully see by, by that chart we had previously, we have a modular architecture by design. So being able to bundle traditionally siloed products together, um, some customers maybe take, you know, one, they've got a renewal up for an incumbent product, they'll take one product, like perhaps email, and then a few months later, they'll tag on web and CASB and identity and so on and so forth. You can do that at, at literally the click of a button once you have one um, module installed. Um, so that that's really, again, something about reducing that operational burden that comes with it. And I guess a few buzzwords that I've avoided specifically, um, but, but are worth a mention here. Um, SASE, SSE, ZTNA, the, the kind of things or the Gartnerism, so to speak, that get thrown around. Very enterprise oriented, uh, but really when you boil them down to their, their kind of key components, it still comes down to the how. How are they implemented? If you look at SSE, for instance, web security, CASB, and then the networking element of zero trust. So this is like a VPN replacement, for example. We have chosen specifically to focus for now on the first two elements, but then add more value through adjacent complementary um, that you can kind of see in yellow down the bottom half of there. So it doesn't necessarily fit within the acronym itself um, that, that the analysts have, have tried to pigeonhole things into. But when you think of it a little bit more holistically, it's really, how can I you know, deliver a good security posture, balance of controls, lowering my risk, and don't annoy my users? That, that's really about it. Uh, it doesn't have to be any more complicated that in reality. So that approach that we've taken, thankfully, and, and you know, something we're really proud of, has been really widely recognized through, through 22 and, and, and 23. Um, we've got another two nominations pending for the rest of, you know, as we close out this year, but it's been a really good year for you know, building that brand, building that credibility uh, and the recognition from, from the industry, not only for our technology, but for the wider uh, kind of business as a whole. So we've, you know, received awards for client support, you know, that, that white glove service I talked about that we're really proud of, as well as our innovation. Um, you know, we recently won uh, what, what uh, the computing security awards term, the one to watch, uh, for next year. So that is, you know, again, great um, uh, appreciation of what we're trying to do with the ethos as well as the technology. And, and that's really reflected in our client list as well. You know, many of the brands here you'll recognize across the sectors from both public and private in um, healthcare, education, public services. We've got a, a, a sweet spot there again. So we've got a number of NHS trusts and uh, commissioning support units and so on that we're protecting, but also then in education establishments, you know, multi-academy trusts, uh, and then in the not-for-profit and charitable sector, you know, it really aligns that, uh, that kind of minimization of operational burden with a modest budget and, and an ongoing management that makes it an ideal fit. And that, and that kind of final piece in the puddles puzzle for many of these organizations. And, and that's really important. Again, uh, a point of pride for us is that notion of retention. You know, there are always going to be corner cases where an organization is going to have some weird and wacky network configuration that maybe we need to handhold them from, from, from day one through a deployment. But the platform really does speak for itself, you know, as does our focus on, you know, that, that those industry verticals, the, the profile of the customer and, and making sure that we, 
we share in their success and their protection. And you, know, you can kind of see that demonstrated in some of the comments here, right? It, it's uh, you know something that that we're really proud of, as I say, something that we've achieved. Um, and this is reflected in our growth and, and in our re net retention rate, which is well over 100%. So not only do we retain the customers, that, but they see that modular platform solution as, as part of their growth strategy and their success for the future. So they buy more and, and, uh, and, and grow with us. So let, let's take a double click down, I guess, into the platform in more detail. And I'm not going to go every single switch and button and, and menu item, but it's really just to give you some context. Uh, and hopefully this is enough of a teaser to, you know, maybe have another conversation. You can obviously get in touch with us directly, not that hard to find on LinkedIn, and, you know, book a demo so we can look at this as it relates to your environment and your um, installation specifically. But, you know, this is the kind of why as to the, the ethos behind that platform approach. So, you know, hopefully we've covered everything we've kind of covered today. You, you kind of get an appreciation for the benefits, but when you look at how the landscape is evolving, it, it should, and, and hopefully just, just make sense, you know, with the majority of attacks starting off via a human factor. So a phishing email or social engineering, for example, we absolutely have to maintain the security of that as a main priority. but when you factor in that, you know, two thirds of the attacks that start with an email are multi-channel or, or have a multi-stage payload, i.e. they span email, web, maybe a cloud file share somewhere or, or you know, some service that's based on a reputable domain even, you know, it, it, it becomes more important that you have this interconnectivity. And um, if you look at the industry analysis, um, you know, less than 40% of the mid-market can actually you know, effectively protect against these types of threats that are multi-channel and 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 multi uh, and multi uh, multi-stage payload. So the rationale is clear why we do what we do. Hopefully, and and I touched on ACE a little bit earlier at high level, but this is really the concept. So, you know, let's say you um, you visit a, a legitimate or a reputable domain that's maybe weaponized at a later date. So at some point, some malware gets uploaded there by, by the bad guys, for example, obviously your web security or, or your CASB would detect that, you know, when that file is delivered, it's malicious, or when you try to access it, we would block the download. That, that's kind of a given. But then when you start to use your, your threat telemetry and your intel to then map the attributes and the characteristics of that file in real time and share that information with the other modules, you can then imagine that if for some reason that same file gets sent to you via an email attachment uh, or via a different service, you've already got that protection because we've analyzed it, we've seen it before, we've, we've, we've done all our kind of ML and, and behavior analytics, and we've got a really good view of what that file is trying to do. It takes that load away from the data scientists and the, the security analysts that would traditionally have to you know, sandbox it, emulate it, run their own analysis, and then you know, write a rule that then applies to web security and, and deploy it that way. So again, it's reducing that operational burden. And ACE is really just a framework. You know, it, it, it's we touched on already, it's orchestration, it's interconnectivity. So it enables you to make programmatic links um, without having to have plugins or, you know, make complex workarounds through intermediate services. You know, the, the I guess the best way to think about this is that where each module, so email, web, CASB, MFA, identity, has its own set of vertical rules. ACE has them horizontally. So it can make decisions. It can, it can apply actions to remediate them across that entire sur attack surface automatically or autonomously. Um, so again, it's another feather in the cap for um, reducing that, that, that burden. And this is really our view of, of that protection stack as a, as a all those technologies wrapped in a consistent UI, easy to deploy, easy to manage. You can get it up and running out of the box, you know, create your policies. Although we give you, I would imagine, 80% of those policies out of the box. And then it comes back to that notion of delivering time to value, you know, very efficient, very effectively. Um, having said that, a lot of it has got to be seen to be, uh, to be believed. So as I said, please do feel free to book a demo and then we'll show you it live in action and, and what it means to me. So 
you know, as I said earlier, you know, the platform spans the entire attack surface, but being that it's modular, you can add these elements and cherry pick as you see fit. You know, there is the obvious synergy between certain modules and the use cases that, that you might have. So, for example, you know, combining email and SAT, um, a security awareness training, gives you good protection against email attack, but also you're educating the users such that you don't have to rely on the technology. You know, they're... I guess we've termed it in the past the human firewall, as it's as been called, right? So again, it's that notion of defense in depth, or you know, perhaps you want to pair email and web security. Again, something that we see a lot, depending on renewal times of, of an incumbent vendor, you might do one and then a couple of months later do another. Um, and this goes some way to plug some of the gaps that are, are inherent in a lot of the point products, uh, especially with you know some of the stats that we've just looked at when it comes to cross-channel attack. Um, Casby highly popular at the moment. I said he's pairing web and, and cloud application security together. I mean, I would argue that these are now table stakes for many organizations who, who use SaaS applications and you know are now hybrid or remote since the pandemic. This really takes that binary approach of allow and block um, or allow and deny to the next level. So you're adding in these granular controls, you know, more insights and, and, and individual action control such that you can start to profile your user behavior, their, their intent, and you can create a, a risk profile when it comes to things like data breach or, or, or potential data loss, just by having a few modules that, that, that talk to each other and communicate. And then finally, it's everything together, what we call total protection or, or, or a bundle of everything. That is galvanizing web, email, and, uh, and cloud application security with the additional layer of DLP on top or, or underneath or through, however you see fit. It's really the glue that, that, that binds them. This gives you that really, really strong risk posture. You know, the modules protect almost all of the attack surface. And they allow you to have that really granular level of control whilst at the same time minimizing that user friction that we know we want to uh, try and, 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 uh, and, and mitigate, you know, as we've said, knowing that that is the enemy of security. If our users try workarounds and, and try and get around your security policies, that's no good for anyone. So we need to work with our users um, kind of in mind, I guess. So that's the, the whistle stop tour. Um, there, there are a couple of architecture um, or design items, I guess, that are worth. So let, let's go into that more detail and, and maybe finish off here. So you've seen already that when it comes to protection, um, when it comes to web and CASB, the, 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 the why, the, this is really the how, right? So most architectures, including Microsoft 365, uses a, a, a hosted proxy or an API type of architecture that maybe uh, it's a proxy or session based or, or through your firewall logs. And that really means that every cloud based SaaS application that the platform doesn't support natively requires you to uh, create an API connection through, through a proxy. And then when the user requests a website or, or a, a cloud application, they're sent to uh, either a forward or a reverse proxy, which would intercept that traffic and then it would talk to the target. And then it would relay the traffic back. So you've offensively got this middleman that is doing the scanning and, and offloading it. And that is going to add latency to your user experience. It's going to require hardware infrastructure to be managed, which add costs and, and complexity. And it doesn't always give you the level of detail when it comes to reporting. Obviously, a lot of the attributes when you go via a proxy might be invisible or masked, things like IP addresses and, and so on and so forth. So it's not ideal. Now, we've taken a different view of this. Um, we have created something we call direct protect. And in this case, when you request that same service, we would still intercept and analyze the traffic, but we're only intercepting the metadata. And then we're doing the enforcement and the policy management on the device locally through an agent or, or through a gateway. There, there are various different options depending whether you're home based, BYOD, office based, so on and so forth. And that means that if after doing that analysis, the response is allowed. There is no risk. We then just release the user directly with that service. There is no middleman. There is no latency. That entire round trip of request, analyze, and release takes about 35 milliseconds. So it's you know, a factor of 10 or, or exponentially quicker than you know, these traditional 
swig based proxies and you don't have the complexity and the, the the infrastructure to deal with and the other benefits that come with that are you know you can deliver that experience with the goal of reducing that user friction even further so so for example i search google and if i'm going to a, a proxy and my nearest proxy is in frankfurt i might get or, or actually it's highly likely that i will get german search results back or i'll search for something near me and it'll give me a location in in, in germany because that's my closest proxy server you know, on top of that, you might have SaaS applications that use IP allow listing. Um, they will need to be modified. So again, that operational burden is just uh, reduced by using this direct protect architecture. Um, if like many of us, we're a home user and we've got super fast, you know, broadband uh, fiber to the premises, you know, you get to use all that, you know, those hundreds, if not gigabits of bandwidth, you are not limited by a shared server somewhere that has a, a finite pipe to go through. Um, so all in all, balancing that complexity or reducing the complexity, um, giving the users the best experience possible, that's the key tenant here. So that's one. And then, you know, the second architecture differentiator, and this really relates to CASB. When we talk about controlling an individual user action or activity, not just that binary allow or deny, this is the approach where ARM comes in and arm is what we call action risk methodology and that's really the tool that sits there behind the scenes we we automatically classify thousands of SaaS applications out there and services not not at a, a kind of arbitrary vendor level that you might see with uh, with some of the vendors but we're analyzing every single interaction that you could have with that service and we assign that action or that activity a baseline risk score so low medium high very high you can then create policies at a very, very granular level. So an example here might be, we'll allow people to access Google Drive. You know, our sanctioned app is OneDrive, but we have partners and agencies that use Google. But in that instance, let's allow them to download content from the partners, but not upload. So we're again, mitigating that risk of, of, of data loss. Um, or let's say we use Google Cloud or Gmail, but we only want them to access the corporate instance of Gmail, not personal. And again, you can put restrictions in place to, uh, again, uh, you know, secure. So it's highly, highly advanced, highly detail controlled. But a lot of this, we've done the legwork for you. So we've already classified, you know, five plus thousand interactions that you can have with these SaaS applications. You could create one single policy out of the box that just says block everything that is high risk. Or you could say block everything that is high risk if it's cloud file sharing, those, those kind of those. And in a couple of clicks, you've got a really, really high security posture out of the box. Again, very, very simple, very, very seamless. And you know, whilst those are the kind of technology aspects of this, you know, we cannot look at the you can't overlook the interface itself. So what you can kind of see here on screen in the background itself is what we call our visual rule builder. And, and that's really the the kind of bread and butter approach to how you define policies all the modules share this same look and feel so once you can create a policy for one you can do it for all um, the filters work top to bottom left to right so you know obviously an email policy is going to look slightly different because of the things you're looking for than than say web but the way you management is is, is the same so it's kind of like a firewall configuration in some extent so the rule builder in every instance has three pillars a condition to match an activity or an action you want to take, and then an optional final action. So that could be block, allow, uh, log on, like, you know, that, those kind of things. And this is entirely drag and drop, as you can kind of see demonstrated in the background here. So we'll give you a bunch of policies out of the box. You can get started, and then you know we have CSM teams, customer success that would, you know, maybe help you define more bespoke or more tailored uh, policies that you might want to tweak or tailor to your own environment. But it is as easy as Drag and drop, create your policies, hit save, and you're done. You know, you can segment to as much granularity as you desire, you know, device, AD, user group, time, location, IP, and then you can add in as many actions on top of each other as, as you want. So, you know, you can um, uh, reroute emails, add behaviors, add banners into messages, you know, show customized pages when you, when you want to block an action or just give a warning. Um, all brandable, all tailored to, to your liking. Again, very, very seamless, out of the box. Um, again, seeing is believing, I think, on this one.
So to wrap up, I um, appreciate we're the, the kind of top of the hour now. Um, I guess if I were to summarize what we do, this would be it in, in a single slide. So this is a kind of key takeaway. And I don't want to go into everything because I have kind of already touched on this, but really, as I said earlier, simplification, consolidation uh, versus point products and a unified, true, single pane of glass. And you'll see that when uh, when you you know pick up a demo or go on our website and look at some of the kind of product tours, we have everything based around something that we call unified security service. So this is that dashboard that you've kind of just seen uh, a little teaser to um, as, and how you would, would deploy, manage, uh, you know, provision, license, everything in that that single uh, single URL. So that's it. Um, I'll, I'll take a breath there and obviously thank everybody for spending uh, the last hour with me. Hopefully it was insightful. You know, you've got some uh, some key takeaways. It has been recorded. So, you know, please free to uh, watch it back, to digest at your own pace and, and, and share it. Um, and as I said at the beginning, please do reach out if you've got any questions. Uh, if you want to, you know, contact on LinkedIn, or you want more information, you can do that through us directly, through uh, through the website, through chat, um, or um, you know, any any way you, you see fit. Um, but the door is open, and I'd say I would um, suggest having a, a more detailed look at the uh, the, the portal and, and you know, the, a more, a more bespoke, tailored conversation between the between the. Uh, your organization hours but with that i'll uh, i'll say thank you again and uh, enjoy the rest of your day take care everyone brilliant thank you uh, gareth for uh, well what was an insightful presentation um i'm sure all of you watching will take something different away um i think one of the takeaways for me is um you know it's it's uh, not a question of if uh, basically you will you'll be um, you will have a cyber attack of some description. It's just when. Um, and I know many of you out there uh, will be um, not particularly IT. Uh, and literate is probably a bit, bit uh, strong of a word. But um, the good thing about this is that um, at EBS, we deliver uh, all of what you've just seen, really, um, as part of a managed service. So you don't, don't have to worry about deploying that particularly if you don't have an IT manager or an IT department, uh, we'll take that burden away from you. Um, now, in in respect of what you know, what's what's next uh, for you, I'm sure that there'll be many, many questions, and and um, you potentially won't know, you know, which of the uh, solutions that you've seen today are appropriate to you. Uh, the fact of the matter is probably that all of them are um, to to some level. Uh, and uh, as I say, again, um, we can take that burden away from you and uh, deliver a solution that actually gives you uh, protection against cyber threats with not just um, the SensorNet applications. You know, we... We believe that everyone should have a hardware firewall, as a, as a for instance. Um, we're also engaged with a number of our clients with um, helping them get Cyber Essentials certification. So again, you can talk to us about that. There will be a link in the um, in, in 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 this video that you can click to um, find out more. Uh, but alternatively, uh, you can call us. Uh, or email us, and uh, the details will be on the screen shortly. Um, but thanks for joining today. And, uh, you know, as I say, don't hesitate to get in touch if you've got any questions or queries about what you should do next. Thanks for your time. Bye bye.